welcome, welcome. What a wonderful day. I appreciate you being here. What about this weather? Good old Tennessee weather, cool in the morning and overalls or coveralls in the mornings and uh, short pants in the evening, right? Something like that. Hey, Amen. Glad you're here. Glad you're here. I'm glad to see everybody. Appreciate you being here. Got some visitors with us. I'm so thankful. I, I'm going to start just with for, for a moment. I just recognize there are so many preachers and pastors have uh, come in here tonight. So I want to ask you if, if you're a a pastor, a preacher, a pastor for church, would you would you mind standing with us? I want to recognize you. If you don't mind standing, if you're a pastor or preach. Very good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Brother Terry, start back there in the back. Let us know who you are. Wattsburg. <laughs> Inform us right here. Tell us. Introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Sure. Hey, ma'am. I'm glad you're here. Yes, sir. Hello. Burn. Good to have you. Brother Allen? Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Y'all be praying for me. I get to be with Allen on Saturday, and I'm so excited to get. I don't go out very much, and I appreciate Allen getting to preach. I get to preach on Saturday night to his men, and I'm excited about it. I appreciate Brother Allen. Yeah, but Monday night, yeah. Yes, sir. Roger here, you're a fine man. I tell you, Brother Roger has encouraged me over the years, prayed for me every day. I just know he has, and I appreciate him so very much. Bill Boggs, yes, sir. Philippines, hey, man. We love the Filipino people. I know we do, and we know Brother Brian. Uh, Brother Bill was saying he come in today and he said he hijacked one of your messages. I just thought I'd let you know he hijacks. And I and the only reason I'm telling it because I hijacked your message too. I don't know how many I preached of his. And boy, they'll pat me on the back. And I said, thank you, Brother Brian. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what. I'll take a stick of a, of a man of God and beat the devil with it. That's right. There's nothing new under the sun. I don't come up with anything. This is all under the word of God anyway. I tell you what, I love man. Be a fool not to use another man's knowledge and wisdom. He'd be a fool not to do that. Uh, we go through life asking questions on how to fix a car or how to do this or do that. Somebody has taught you something. Man, I'm going to put myself under somebody that knows the Word of God and try to help me. Absolutely, I want that. I want that so much. Thank you, men, for being here. When I moved to Towsville, Tennessee, Actually, Knoxville, when we moved to Knoxville, I will never forget my wife and I moved to Corrington. We were in pursuit of a, going to school there in Knoxville, and I laid back over the bed. We'd moved from Shelbyville, Tennessee, my hometown. My wife and I both grew up there. I thought I'd lived and died there. Got saved, got called to preach, come up here, and I laid back on the bed. We moved to Corrington. I said, honey, we know nobody but the Lord. <laughs> we don't know anybody in this area. And there was a little sickening feeling come over me, honestly, because I left everything I knew and loved, family members, friends, the whole town, really. And I came to a place I had no, knew nobody. And God began to cultivate friendships and people that crossed my path. And still yet today, my heart is overwhelmed with gratitude because I'm looking across the face of people that God has allowed me to cross paths with that have helped me and iron sharpeneth iron and has helped guided this ministry and helped me as a Christian. And I just want to say thank you. My heart is full of gratitude uh, just looking at you fellows and the church folks here tonight. And God's good, isn't he? Yeah. Amen. Let's pray together, and then we'll sing a song or two, and then Little Baron Church is going to sing a little bit, and we'll just worship the Lord together, and Brother Brian's going to come preach to us. And uh, he's done such a phenomenal job last night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and there's no doubt in my mind God's going to use him tonight. 
Uh, but let's ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we pause. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. And my heart is truly full of gratitude. And I look across the faces of these men and women that have influenced me, that have taught me the Bible and have led, helped, led me in the right paths. Thank you for the men of God that have studied the Word of God and have weathered the, the storms of the ministry and have come out on the other side faithful and a victor. And I'd ask that you would just bless every single ministry that's represented in this room tonight. I'd ask that you would just put your hand upon it. Thank you, Lord, for our dear brother from the Philippines. And, Lord, you know how much we love those people. And I just ask that you would just bless in a supernatural way. Please, oh, God, oh, God, breathe upon this meeting, I pray. Bless every man of God that's in this room that uh, got, has got wearied in the way. Lord, thank you. Uh, that the sons of Kohath, it was on their shoulders. Lord, I know these men have the weight of the ministry on their shoulders. And so I'd ask that you'd strengthen them and help them. Bless Brother Brian as he preaches. I pray you'd fill him from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. I pray you'd be filled with an unction from the Holy One. Please do that which we cannot do. Work in the hearts of people. Lord, as we sing and worship you, I'd ask that you would just guide our lips and our mind and our heart and put away the things of the world for just a little while while we're in your house, and please speak to us. We invite you to speak to us. We want you to speak to us. We need you, Lord, to speak to us. We're hungry tonight, and so we'd ask that you do something supernatural. May eternity be effected tonight, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing a song or two. Let's get our heart right with the Lord, and let's worship him in spirit and truth. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would your evil of victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. is going to sing for us now a song, Resurrection Power.
Aren't you so glad? The resurrection power. You can go to the tomb of Buddha. You can go to the tomb of Confucius. You can go to the tomb of Muhammad. And their bodies are still there. But you can go to the tomb of Lord Jesus Christ. And his body's not there. Because he rose again. We're going to sing our church chorus. And I call it our church chorus because our pastor loves it. And we love it. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's something about that name. Something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance after the rain, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms may all pass away, but there's something about that name. And you may be seated there. I'm so glad you stood because you can't talk to Jesus without standing or at least kneeling. I've been in the presence of people and uh, I think it's disrespectful in my mind to sit and talk to someone without standing, especially shaking their hand or speaking. Could you imagine? I just thought of that as you stood. Could you imagine sitting somewhere? I remember I heard a story of Dr. J.R. Faulkner. Every time Lee Robertson would walk into the church building, it didn't matter where J.R. Faulkner was sitting, anywhere in the building. As soon as J., uh, Dr. Uh, Robertson would walk in the building, he would stand to his feet as respect under that man. And I thought as I sat there and we started singing his name, if he walked into this building, there'd be no way I'd sit in that seat. Disrespectful, irreverent. So it moved my heart to see you stand and reverence the name of Jesus, because there truly is something about that name. That really is. And I appreciate that. That's so sweet. I appreciate you singing that. Well, I'm going to let the little, little Baron Church sing a little bit. They are tremendous. I appreciate their spirit. I appreciate their honoring the Lord with their music. And so y'all sing a little bit, just whatever the Lord leads you to do. Just help yourself, brother. Brother Danny is always on cue, buddy. I tell you, he's ready. He told us when he came the first time, he said, Preacher, I sing by letter. I said, I have no idea what that means. He said, we open our mouth and let her fly. I said, bring it, buddy. I like it. I'm awful, yeah. <laughs> and he's real quiet, you can tell. Amen.
know this is the Lord's house, right? Huh? My father owns this place. Uh, praise the Lord. One day when Oft I thought about that moment when I'll leave this earthly race. My soul fills with anxious 
be called the Christian cultivators. What you do with old fallow ground, you break it up. You put the plow in there and you turn the ground and you get it tore, you get it tore up. And then you bring a cultivator along behind it and you get it really broke up. And that's what good godly music does to your heart. It cultivates your heart. I mean, how could you not cultivate and get ready for the seed to fall on good ground? Talking about beholding him. I'm going to see his face. Ah, oh, that, that puts me somewhere. That, that gets me where I can listen to the man of God and, and hear the word of God and it fall on good ground. I, I, Christian cultivators, that's just singing right right there, brother. I just, that, just, that just fits y'all, I tell you. It does. Y'all cultivated a good spirit in here to, uh, to let the word of God fall. I, I thank you, thank you. I, he said he inhabits his praises. We say, I, 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 I'll have to get around God. Well, get to praising him. He'll show up. He'll show up, won't he? Yeah. Amen. Boy, y'all have helped me. I think I'm, y'all have helped me. I appreciate y'all coming. Amen. Well, Brother Brian McBride needs no introduction. If you've been in the Christian circle any length of time, you've probably heard one of his messages, or like me and Brother Bob, we preached several of his. 
And uh, I, I just appreciate, I told somebody the other day, I'm not looking for some profound preacher trying to help me solve my, all my problems. I'm trying to get around a man of God that knows the Bible, yeah. that knows the God that can solve my problems. And he's that man, and I appreciate him. Over the 15 years or so, he's been coming to Twin City Baptist Church preaching for us. Never has it failed that he's not fed me something from the Word of God. And he has taught me some things. Sunday morning, Nason. I've never heard anybody preach on Nason. You ought to go back and listen to it. And he preached last night about Jonathan. And the one thing, Jonathan, he didn't want to go. He didn't want to leave the palace. Never seen that. I preached on Jonathan for 25 years and never seen that. I told some other day at a prayer meeting, I said, I've never heard a man preach a message on the genealogy of the Scripture. Go, go through the genealogies and get begot, 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 begot. How do you get a message out of that? He pulled one out of there. The shoe, the one shoe. I'm pre- you know why I know them? Because I've been preaching them. <laughs> i got to memorize, man. He's, he's done good. I appreciate him. I appreciate his friendship. Not only just his handle on the Word of God, I appreciate his friendship. And I get to have him around and get to spend some time with him and, and uh, just fellowship with him. But he's going to come and preach, brother. You just help yourself and just do whatever. I know the Lord leads you. Well, amen. I'm glad to be here tonight. As the Hebrew writer put it, assemble together with the saints of God. And I can't think of anywhere I'd rather be than right here. Thank you for allowing me to come. Thank you for the good singing tonight. I enjoyed the choir and I enjoyed the Christian cultivators over here. It's a blessing. That name is stuck to you now. Amen. Like bu- like bubble gum under a table. It's stuck to you. My, uh, my sister-in-law was in the hospital one time, and we were up there visiting her. Her little, her little boy was there, and all of a sudden we noticed him chewing gum. And his mama said, where'd you get that gum? And he pointed underneath the tray and the table. It was stuck there, so that name stuck to you. But uh, I'm glad to be here, glad to be part of the service. Good to see some preachers I know and that I haven't seen in a while. I got to spend some time with your pastor today, and I greatly enjoyed that. And I want to thank you for the nice meals I've been eating and the wonderful place I have to stay. The Lord sure has been good to me, and I appreciate all your kindness. We're going to be in Genesis. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. And uh, these fellows talking about preaching messages. I always figured if if uh, I found some ammunition that fit in my gun, I'd go ahead and shoot it. Amen. Right. And um, the Lord, the preacher's right. There's no new thing under the sun. There's some folks, they run around looking for new stuff all the time. i got to have something new. But my old friend, uh, my old preacher used to say, Brother Jack Grigsby used to say, if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. It's that same old gospel, the old, old story is what makes us what we are today. So I want to talk to you a bit about from the life of Joseph. Now, we looked at Nason on Sunday morning last night. We spent a little time with uh, David and Jonathan. And I know Jonathan is not really an obscure character in the Bible, but he is a puzzling character in the Bible. We looked at him a little bit. But I want to look at a lady here in the Word of God from the life of Joseph. There were five women uh, that I think had an influence in Joseph's life. One of them was his mother, Rachel. I like to call her the unlovely woman. Though she was beautiful and well-favored on the outside, she was ugly on the inside. She never did uh, really serve God. She was envious. And then there was another woman that would have had an effect or influence in Joseph's life, and that was his mother's sister. Her name was Leah. I call her the unloved woman because Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. And the next verse says, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated. Now, that's interesting language because the Bible said he didn't hate her. He said he loved her more than or loved Rachel more than Leah. But then God said when he saw that she was hated. Now, that verse will help you in the New Testament. When you come across the verse that tell, where Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you have to hate your mother and hate your father and hate your family. And you say, preacher, what's that mean? Well, here's what it means. When you took the love that Jacob had for Rachel and set it next to the love he had for Leah, that love looked like hatred because he loved Rachel so much more. 
And the Bible's telling us when you take the love we have for Christ and set it next to the love we have for anyone else in this world, it ought to look like hatred in comparison to the love that we have for Christ. That Old Testament help you understand that New Testament. Amen. And then there was another woman. Uh, I call her the unlawful woman. Her name, we don't know her name, but she was the wife of Potiphar. And she was the wife that tried to get Joseph to commit adultery and to do an unlawful act. And uh, certainly she had an effect in his life. She ended up, he ended up in the prison. And then there's a woman I preached on her here before. I call her the unlisted woman. Her name is Deborah. And you'll find Deborah all the way back in the days of Rebecca and Isaac getting married. And you'll find her all the way through dying as Joseph is a young man. Four generations, she was a servant to the people of God. She teaches us something about longevity in our service. About just staying by the stuff. Just being faithful. And you know when she died, she was a servant. But when she died, the Bible said they buried her under an oak. And they called the name of it Alan Bokcheth, which means or backeth, which means the oak of weeping. So she is just a servant, but she was serving so long and so faithfully when she died, they treated her like they'd lost a part of the family. That's what happens when you serve. Sooner or later, sooner or later, they'll be reaping for what you've sold. But the woman I'm interested in tonight, I'm going to call her the unlikely woman. Her name is Azanath. And she is the bride of Joseph. And I want to read about her. She's mentioned three times, once in each of three verses in our Bible. You remember Joseph now. I'm going to read in a minute. It'll just take me a minute to get there. Uh, you know, I think about Joseph. Joseph in our Bible is a wonderful picture in the Old Testament of our Lord Jesus Christ. You hear a preacher say sometimes, well, such and such is a type or so and so is a type. And you say, what in the world does that mean? Well, here's the best way I know to explain it. Did you ever meet somebody and the way they talked or their gestures or the way they moved or the way they looked reminded you of somebody else? And you said to your wife, boy, doesn't he remind you of Joe or doesn't she remind you of Mary? Well, that's what we're talking about with a type in the Bible. We read in the Old Testament and when we read about somebody, that Old Testament character or that Old Testament circumstance reminds us of a New Testament truth. Now, you cannot call any Old Testament character character a type really technically unless they're stated as a type in the New Testament and Joseph is never stated as a type but he is a picture of the Lord Jesus he reminds me of my Savior say preacher how does he do that well he was beloved of his father jo Joseph was loved by Jacob he was put uh, over his brethren and his brethren hated him and despised him and the Bible said they threw him in a pit and they and he came up out of that pit alive and he went into a far country and he took a Gentile bride and he became the breadwinner for his family back home and then one day he came back and brought them to himself and took them to that far country that's just like Jesus he's beloved of his father but he was hated by his brethren he came unto his own and his own received him not but to as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God even them that believe on his name they put him down in the pit of death but we heard it in the song. In three days he came up alive out of the pit of death. And what did he do? He ascended into heaven, a far country. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And he became the breadwinner, the dispenser of grace for you and I that are here. He's the bread of life. Amen. And you know what? One of these days he's going to come back and get us. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven. There'll be a shout. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord wherefore comfort one another with these words you remember what Jesus said in John I'm going to get to the preaching in a little bit in John chapter 14 he said let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you unto my myself that where I am there ye may be also so he's a coming back and when he comes back he's going to take us to that heavenly land
land and we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Amen. So I'm just telling you, he reminds, and there are other things, we don't have time to look through them all, but he reminds us of the Lord Jesus. Now I want you to keep that in mind as I preach tonight because we're going to look at a picture of Joseph and his bride. You know how who we are tonight? We that are saved, we are the bride of Christ. Paul said, I have espoused thee as a chaste virgin unto Christ. You're looking tonight at the blushing bride and Jesus is the groom and I'm a heading for a wedding. Amen. And we're going to be wed to him and we're going to live with him forever like Asenath did. Now, I want you to look at your Bible. I've told you that two or three times. I really mean it this time. Genesis chapter number 41. Joseph has been raised up. He's become the second ruler in Egypt. And here's what the Bible said in verse 45 of Genesis 41. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Paneah. Now there's two ideas about what that word, those two words mean. Some say that name means the savior of the world. Others say that name means the revealer of secrets. You can say whatever you want to about it. That's what they called him. Zaphnath Paneah. And now watch this now. And he gave him to wife Azanath, the daughter of Potiphar, not Potiphar, but Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Now that's the first verse where we read about this woman as an F. Here's the second verse. Look in verse 50 of our text. Chapter, verse, chapter 41. Verse 50. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Azanath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. We'll talk about those boys again in a moment. Then in Genesis chapter number 46, we'll read about her a third time in our Bible. Genesis 46 and verse 20. And here the Bible's talking about when the children of Israel come up to Egypt. And the Bible said in verse 20, and unto Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, which Azanath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. I'm going to talk to you about this woman Azanath for a little while and her relationship to Joseph because she is a picture of the church of the bride of Christ. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, we sure do love you tonight. We're sure thankful for you. We're so glad to be assembled together with the saints of God. We're glad to be saved by your amazing grace and kept by your wonderful grace. We're glad that heaven is our home as sure as we're standing here behind this pulpit. Heaven is our home because we've been born again. Now I pray you'll help us if there's somebody in the service that is lost without God and without hope in this world. I pray they'd give their heart to Christ tonight. They'd trust him as their savior. And then Lord, I pray for those of us that are saved, that you might draw us closer unto thee, that you might help us be more thankful for what you've done for us. And we will thank you for what you do. Get glory unto yourself. In Jesus name, I pray. Amen. Now I'm thinking about Joseph being raised up. I won't go through all of these, but there's a royal ring. There's a royal robe. There's a royal ring richness. There's a royal ride. There's a royal rulership. And then there is a royal relationship. Joseph is going to take a bride. Somebody's going to become his wife. Joseph, as I've mentioned, is a type of Christ. And Azaneth, this Egyptian bride, is a type of the church. She is a Gentile bride of the Savior of the world. Now, I I like to call her tonight the unlikely woman for this reason. You and I know about Joseph. Joseph. We know what a spiritual man Joseph was. We know Joseph's, uh, he has his eyes upon God all the time. In every major event of Joseph's life, you know who he talks about? He talks about God. When when, uh, Potiphar's wife tried to get him to sin, you remember what he said? He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? She had him thrown in the prison, or her husband did because she lied. When he's in the prison, the butler and the baker are there. They're in the prison house. They both had dreams. They don't know what the interpretation of it is. Joseph walks in one day. This always tickles my funny bone right here. He walks in one day and he looks at him and their countenance are sad. And he said, why look ye so sadly today? And I want to say, because we're all in prison. He said, why look ye so sadly? And they said, because we've had a dream and there's none to interpret. You remember what Joseph said? He said, do not interpretations belong unto 
God. Tell me the dream thereof. And then when he's raised up out of the prison and he's brought before Pharaoh, because Pharaoh's had that dream. You remember it, the seven lean fat years and the seven lean years. He's had a dream about it twice. And they bring Joseph up because the butler remembers about his interpretation. And Pharaoh says to him, I have heard of thee that thou canst interpret dreams. And what did Joseph say? He said, it is not in me, O king. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And then when he has these boys, he says, God hath made me to forget. And God hath made me fruitful. And then when his brothers show up that sold him into slavery and might as well have killed him for selling him into slavery. Here's what he said. You meant it unto evil, but God meant it unto good. And then he's on his deathbed and they come in around him. And here's what he said. I die, but God shall surely visit you. You know what we learn about Joseph? He can't get his eyes off God. No wonder he's got peace. The Bible said, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee. And so here is Joseph, and he is this spiritual man. Now, here's what I would think. I would think that this spiritual Jew, this spiritual Hebrew, would go find him a wife among the Hebrews, would go find him a wife among the Jews. You remember when Abram was looking for a wife for Isaac? He said, don't take one of these Canaanites. He told Elie, he said, you go back to my people. But here is Joseph, the spiritual Joseph, the man of God, the God in man's hand, or the man in God's hand. Who does he take for a bride? He takes a Gentile bride. I'm surprised at that. I'm wondering at that. I want to say, Joseph, what does a man like you see in a woman like her? Hey, would you look up here? You know what I ought to say tonight? I ought to say, Jesus, what does somebody like you see in somebody like me? Why would a Savior like you want to have anything to do with a sinner like me? I ought to look at God the Father and say, God, why should somebody as holy as you want to have anything to do with somebody as hell-bent as me? Lord, I just don't understand it. I may not understand why Joseph would take an Egyptian wife, but what, what makes my heart even more, more uh, puzzled is that God in heaven would send his son and his son would take somebody like me and say, somebody like me. You say, well, preacher, I'm pretty good. No, you're not. You're as wicked and unuseful as dirt. Are you listening? You're a sinner born in sin. There wasn't one good thing about you. That's what the Bible said. Paul said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. You say, oh, preacher, I don't know if I'd say I'm as useless as dirt. Well, that's what you're made out of. Amen. Made out of the dirt. Somebody said, I come from a good lineage. I'll tell you about your lineage. Every one of us can trace our ancestry back to a gardener who got thrown out of the garden for stealing his master's fruit. Every one of us. We trace our lineage back to Adam in the garden who was a thief. We're all sinners and come short of the glory of God. But hallelujah, the Bible said, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wonder of wonder wonders that he would love us. And I want to say three things to you about this unlikely bride, this unlikely woman. The first thing I want you to notice, because each one of these verses has a different emphasis in it. In the first verse, the emphasis is on the presenting of the wife. The Bible said this, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Paneah, and he gave him to wife Azanath, the daughter of Potiphar priest of On. So here we have a wife given by Pharaoh unto Joseph. Jesus used this language. It's not Calvinist language. It's not fatalist language. But he said, all, who the fa- all that the Father have given me will come to me. He said, I've not lost one that you gave me. You know what? I don't understand it all. I can't explain it all. But I do know this. Somehow we're chosen before the foundation of the world. But wait a minute. I left out two little words in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Chosen in him before the foundation of the world. I would explain it this way. God the Father said, 
said anybody gets in Christ is chosen. Anybody that'll trust Christ is chosen. We're chosen. Doesn't leave anybody out. Doesn't mean anybody can't get in. The Bible is a whosoever will salvation and a whosoever will gospel. And if you want to get saved, you can be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Paul said this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. Election does not mean that you can't be saved. Election is not about exclusion. It's about inclusion. I'm getting off the track here, but you don't mind if I run a little rabbit. God, the first, the first example that I can find in my Bible of election is Abraham. Abram, God called him. God chose him. But you remember what he said to him? He said, I'll make of thee a great nation, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And then he said, I will bless thee, and I will make thee a blessing. Now, does that sound like when God said, all the families of the earth shall be blessed, does that sound like he's excluding somebody to you? No, it sounded like he chose Abraham so that he could bless the whole world. And God, this business of election is not about exclusion. It's about inclusion. You know what? If you want to be saved tonight, you can be. No one is left out. So here is this woman. She is given to him. Now, I want you to think about this. When he is, she is given to him, the first thing about her is she's taken out of, a, out of idolatry. Taken out of idolatry. Her name is Azaneth. It means the daughter of Net. And Net was a e false Egyptian goddess. Her father is the priest of An. And An was a city in Egypt where they worshipped the sun god. So she has been raised in idolatry. She'd been raised in false worship. But you know what? Joseph lifted her out of that. Joseph did not believe in the sun, S-U-N, God. Joseph did not believe in Net, the goddess of Egypt. Joseph believed in Jehovah. God and when she married him he brought her out of idolatry that's what happened with all of us when we got saved we were saved out of our old idolatry you say well preacher I never worshipped a totem pole I never bowed down no but I'll tell you what we did bow down to we bowed down to ourselves we loved ourselves we worshipped the creature more than the creator but hallelujah when we got saved the Holy Ghost dealt with us we found out there was a real God we found out there was a real Savior and we were saved out of our idolatry she's not only saved out of idolatry she was saved out of depravity now if you would if we would take the time and we won't do it tonight but if we would take the time to study what we learn about Egypt in our Bible we find out it was a wicked place I just mentioned I just mentioned a couple of places Potiphar's wife gives us an idea what Egyptian womanhood was like what was she she was an adulteress it always interested me that she wanted Joseph to lie with her and he wouldn't do it. And, when, and she got her hands on him and got his coat and he ran out. And when her husband came home, he said, she said, you brought this Hebrew in to mock us. And he came in to lie with me. And uh, look, I've got his coat. And it always interested me that her husband did not have Joseph killed. But he had him sent to prison. He was just a slave. He had the power of life and death. You know what I think? I think he knew what kind of wife he had. I think he knew. Because a woman like that, that's not just a one-time deal. Are you listening now? So when we read, that's just one example. When we read about Egypt, we read about a depraved society. A society that was wicked. A society that was ungodly. We, we, we think about her. We think about Hagar. We think about others that we read about from Egypt. And Egypt in our Bible is always a picture of the world. So here is a woman. She is taken out of idolatry. She is taken out of depravity. And then let me say this. She's taken out of obscurity. You know what? We would never have even heard of her except that Joseph took her as his wife. We would never known she existed except Joseph loved her. You know what makes us something? tonight it's not who we are it's the one that loves us that's what makes us something you remember what those sisters said to the Lord about Lazarus when Lazarus had died they sent somebody he was sick they sent somebody to get Jesus do you remember the exact thing he said he said he 
whom thou lovest is sick. He didn't say Lazarus that loves you is sick. It wasn't about Lazarus loving Jesus. It was about Jesus loving Lazarus. I'm going to tell you what makes me somebody tonight. Jesus loves me. It's the most profound, deepest truth I've ever found in the Bible. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. You can't get any deeper than the fact that Christ loves sinners and died on the cross for them. He loved her. She won't fade away into obscurity. She won't be forgotten. She's forever settled in the book of heaven because Joseph loved her. And I'm going to tell you, my name's written down forever in heaven because Jesus loves me. I, hallelujah. Ought to be loved by him. You know what they're telling us today? We're suffering from low self-esteem and we got to learn to love ourselves and learn to respect ourselves. I'm going to tell you something, friend. That comes straight out of the pit of hell. That's not a Bible doctrine. In fact, the Bible never warns me about low self-esteem. It warns me about thinking too highly of myself. You say, well, preacher, I need to some, I need an esteem check. I need, I need something. Here's what you need to know. You need to know that no matter who you are, no matter what you're like, no matter where you came from, no matter what you've done, Jesus loves you and he loved you so much he died on the cross of Calvary and paid your sin debt. It's not about the fact that I love him, although I do. It's about the fact that he loved me with an everlasting love. I love. Oh, no wonder John said, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. No wonder John uh, said in another play, or Paul said this, that great love wherewith he hath loved us. Uh, nobody's ever loved you like Jesus. Nobody could love you like Jesus, but he loves you. I was preaching the 34th or the 43rd, I'm not sure which one anniversary of the Bean Blossom Baptist Church. There's a little blonde-headed girl sitting in the back. First time she'd ever been in our church. And I know on anniversary Sunday you're supposed to preach on precious memories and the goodness of God. But I'd been studying in Romans chapter 9 and I got hung up on that verse, the God who is willing to show his wrath. And so on anniversary Sunday I preached on the wrath of God. I know it's, I know it's, I don't, I know it don't fit, but it's what God told me. So I preached on the wrath of God. And when I got done preaching, I said, now if you're here and you know you're under the wrath of God and you need to be saved and you want me to pray for you, would you raise your hand? That little blonde-headed girl, first time she'd ever been in our church, she lifted up her hand that she needed to be saved. So I prayed and then we had the invitation. I said, now if you'd like to be saved, if you come forward, we'll get somebody to get, sit down with you and take the Bible. And so here she come. And my wife got down beside her on the altar. And I didn't know this till afterwards. She said, what's your name, honey? She said, my name is Alex. She said, what'd you come for, Alex? She said, I, I need to be saved. She said, Alex, what do you know about Jesus? And here's what that little 16-year-old girl said. She said, I know that he died on the cross for my sin. And I know that he really, really loves me. I'm going to tell you, she had it right. But she could have put a few more reallys in there. He loves you tonight. He loves me tonight. You say, preacher, you don't know what I've done. No, but he knows what you've done. And he still loves you. You say, preacher, you don't know where I've been. No, but he knows where you've been. And he still loves you. You say, you don't know where I've come from. I know. I don't know where you've come from. But he knows where you've come from. And he still loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. So how much does he love you enough to die for you? And to take your place. So here's a woman. She has been presented unto him as a bride. The Lord's looking for a bride. You could be part of that tonight. You could get in that tonight. Here's the second thing. Here's the second verse. Now I want you to pay close attention to this verse. Verse 50 in chapter 41. Watch what it said. And unto Joseph were born two sons. Now here's, here's the emphasis on this particular verse. Unto Joseph were born two sons before the years a famine came, which Azaneth, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. Now watch these two boys. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So the first verse about Azaneth had to do with her presentation being pre presented unto Joseph. But the second verse has to do with a period of time. Because the setting of this verse is everything that happened in it happened before the famine. Now, do you know what a famine is in the Word of God? A famine was for two reasons. It was either for chastisement 
because someone had sinned or it was for testing to see if someone would remain faithful. In this particular instance, both things are involved, but the, but the emphasis, the main emphasis on it is, is chastisement. And God is going to show himself, and there is wrath coming. There's going to be seven years of plenty, and then it's going to be followed by seven years of famine. And so they're waiting now. They get married, and here's what they're waiting for. They're waiting for the judgment of God to fall on the world. They're waiting for it. You know what we're waiting for right now? We're waiting for the judgment of God to fall upon the world. There's going to be the rapture of the church, the catching away. There's going to be the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's going to be that tribulation period in between there. It's going to be the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not the time of the church's trouble. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. You said, preacher, where are we going to be? We're going to be at the wedding feast with the Lord Jesus. And we're going to go by the judgment seat of Christ. And there'll be the marriage. And on on this planet earth, there will be seven years of trouble like the world has never known. They were waiting for the judgment of God. And you and I understand that the judgment of God is coming. So what did they do? What did they do while they were waiting? Well, here's what the Bible said. Joseph named these two boys. Now, remember, this is Joseph's wife. The Bible said when a man and a wife get married, the two become one. So what we know about Joseph, we must also say about Azaneth. What are they doing? Listen to me closely now. What are they doing while they're waiting for the famine? They're doing two things. They're being forgetful and they're being fruitful. What do you mean forgetful? Did you hear what he said? It said, and Joseph called the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. You know what's going on here? While they're looking for the famine to come, while they're waiting on the judgment of God, they're going to forget what's behind. They're going to forget what's in the past. They're going to forget all that went on. Joseph said, I tell you what, we're going to forget all the trouble. We're going to forget the pit. We're going to forget being sold. We're going to forget all of that. You know what the Lord would like you to do tonight? He'd like you to do what he's done. He wants you to forget your past. He wants you to forget the trouble. He wants you to forget what you were. He wants you to forget whatever it was that you faced. He wants you to put all that past behind you. That's what Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind. He said, I'm going to leave all that behind. Hey, why do you keep bringing your past up when God has forgotten it? You know what the Bible said? It says in the Old Testament, it's reminded of us in the New Testament. God said, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now that brings up a question in my mind. Because I know from the Bible that God knows everything. So how can a God that knows everything forget anything? Well, let me explain it to you this way. Here's four fellas on the front row. Let's let's say tonight that these four fellas all had the same daddy. And now the daddy has died. And he's left a will. And I'm the executor of the will. And we've gathered together to find out what each one of these four fellas are going to get. So I look at this first fellow and I say, now here's what your daddy left you in the will. And I read what he's left. And then I look at the second fellow and I said, now here's what your daddy left you in the will. And I read what his daddy left him. Then I look at the third fellow and I say, now here's what your daddy left you in the will. And I read it. Then I look at that fourth fellow and I say, now I'm sorry. But here's the language. Here's the lawful legal language. You were not remembered in the will. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean he forgot he had four sons? No, he remembered he had that son, but he didn't leave anything to his account. And when the Bible said their sins and iniquities will I remember no more, that's legal language. And what he's saying is, you know all them sins and iniquities you had? I don't put those on your account anymore. I don't assign them to you anymore. I don't count that toward you anymore. You say, preacher, well, how can he do that? Because they're on somebody else's account. When you got saved, the Bible said he hath made him to become, he hath made him to be sin for us. God the Father, Jesus. God the Father made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here's what he did. When I got saved, he took all of my old sin, all of my past and put it on Jesus' account. And Jesus paid for it on the cross of Calvary. Then he took all the righteousness of Christ and put it on my account. And Jesus never sinned. He did always those things 
things which please the Father. That's why we can say, and Paul can say in Colossians, I am complete. We are complete in Him. Why? Because we have been given, imputed, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And all our past, Jesus bore it to Calvary. Peter said He bore in His body, bore our sin in His body on the cross or to the cross. That we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes she were healed. You say, well, preacher, I remember this. Well, God doesn't. You say, well, preacher, I keep going. Well, God doesn't. Why do you keep bringing up what God will never bring up? It's gone. It's not. It's not even buried in the depths of the sea, although I like that. It's not even as far as the east is from the west. It's not even behind his back. It's washed away in the blood that was shed on Calvary, never to be brought up again, never to be remembered again. You say, preacher, my past is bothering me tonight. No, don't let your past bother you. Think about your future. Think about going to heaven. Think about being washed. We are washed in the blood and saved and on your way to heaven. That past is gone if you're in Christ. So he said, here's what we're going to do while we're waiting for the judgment. We're going to forget. We're going to put the past behind us. And then he said, here's the other thing we're going to do. We're going to be fruitful. We're going to bear some fruit. You had any fruit? Have you borne any fruit? Have you been fruitful in your Christian life? You say, oh, preacher, how do I be fruitful? Well, you could tell somebody about Jesus. That'd be a good start. Tell somebody what he did for you. Tell somebody how he loved you. Be fruitful. Be fruitful. Have the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible said that we are to have the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of Spirit? Well, you read those things. They're the character of Christ. And when you yield unto the Holy Spirit of God, then He produces in you. You don't produce it. He produces the character of Christ. That's fruitfulness. And then the Bible talks about the fruit of our lips, praise unto God. And it talks about the fruit of righteousness. And it talks about fruit to account. Paul said, not that I desire a gift, but I desire fruit to your account. You know what we're supposed to be doing now? We're supposed to be forgetting what went behind. And we're supposed to be pressing on and bearing fruit for the Lord Jesus. Have you had any fruit? Is there any fruit in your life? Say, preacher, why should I bear fruit? Because of what Jesus did for you. You owe him your life. You owe him your eternity. The Bible said, what? No, you're not. Your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Wherefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He owns us. I'll tell you what happened to me today. I had a, I had a, a gift card, and I had to go to Walmart, and I, and I got something. And then when I got it back to the house, because of circumstances, it, it, it was not useful. I couldn't use it like I thought I could. So I took it back, and they were very kind to take it, and the fellow's getting it all put in. He put it all in the computer there, and, and then he said, uh-oh. I said, what? He said, we got to have the gift card. I said, well, after I bought that stuff, the lady that I gave it to, she threw it away. He said, well, we can't give you a refund without the gift card. You got to have the gift card. I said, we don't have it. We threw it away. She threw it away. He said, well, I'm sorry, we can't give you a refund. So I started to pick up the stuff, and he said, oh, you can't take that. I said, what do you mean you can't? I can't take that? He said, we've already entered into our system. Technically, it's ours. So you can't take that. So I looked at it, I said, so you're telling me that you're keeping my money and my merchandise? He said, yes, sir, I'm sorry. And I wanted to say, yeah, me too. But I didn't. He said, I'm going to make some calls and, and see what we can do about this. And I said, well, I appreciate you trying to help me. Now, I didn't feel like saying that. <laughs> but you know why I said that? Because there's a whole bunch of people standing around that work at Walmart. And I wanted to have a testimony. I want to go back, be able to go back in there, and if God opens the door and gets a chance, I want to tell somebody about Jesus. And I didn't want him to look at me and say, you're that guy that lost your temper when you was in here. You're that guy that hollered at us. By the way, I'll tell you this, right before church, the manager called me. He said, Mr. McBride? I said, yes, sir. He said, you come back in tomorrow, and we will take care of you. I said, well, I appreciate it, and I'm sorry I caused you trouble. Always said you didn't cause any trouble. Now, you listen to me. I didn't do what I wanted to do. 
I didn't do what my first inclination was to do because I want to have some fruit. What if I lost my temper in there and one of those folks had come to church tonight and to preach tonight? Now we're going to have Brother McBride get up and preach and they look up here and say, hey, that's that guy yelled at us at, at the Walmart today. I want to have some fruit. It was just the Lord that helped me. I want to have some fruit. Do you have any fruit? Have you won anybody to Christ? Have you told anybody? You say, well, preacher, I, 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 don't, I don't want anybody. Well, have you tried? Have you given out a track? Have you talked to somebody about Jesus? We were in the Walmart one time, and my daughter was handing out tracks. Bethany, she handed a track to a lady, and the lady looked at it, and, she, and Bethany said, will you read that? She said, when I get a minute, I'll read that. Well, must be she got a minute because she chased us out of Walmart and said, can you give me some more of those? I got friends that need to hear this too. Would you bring some more? So we took some more back in. Do you have any fruit? Say, well, Jesus is coming. I'm glad he's coming. I'm looking for him to come. But what are we doing while we're waiting? Here's what we ought to be doing, forgetting and being fruitful. Anybody heard you praise him lately? Anybody heard you say how good he is? I'm not just talking about at church. Thank God we do it at church. Anybody heard you do it at work? Anybody heard you do it at school? Anybody heard you do it in Walmart? Anybody heard you? Anybody heard you? Anybody heard you say, boy, the Lord's good. Boy, God's been good to me. Boy, God has blessed me. I'm talking about the fruit of our lips. Praise unto our God. So here is the unlikely woman. We see her in the presentation of the bride. And then we see her in this period of time waiting for the Lord to come back. And here's the last one. Look in chapter 46 again. And look in this verse. Here they're giving, a, they're giving us an, an enumeration of the people that came up out of Egypt. Or came up out of Canaan into Egypt. All the family. All the boys are named. All the family. But then in verse 20. It makes this exception. It said. And unto Joseph. In the land of Egypt. Were born Manasseh and Ephraim. Which Azaneth the daughter of Potiphar. A priest of On bearing to him. Now the first verse. The theme or emphasis of the verse. Is the presenting of the bride. And the second verse. That we read is the period of time. But here it is the place of service. The land of Egypt. They're in the land of Egypt. You know where we are tonight? Yes. So I preach, we're in the United States of America. Yeah, but spiritually, we're in the land of Egypt. We're in a land that's turned its back upon God. America used to be a Christian nation. It's now become a heathen nation. Used to be, it used to be against the law to let a witch uh, have, a, a, have a class and have a group now in a, in a school. Now it's legal to have a witch's group and illegal to have a Bible group in most. Everything's turned around. Everything's upside down. We're living in the land of Egypt while we're waiting for the Lord to come. Do you know where the majority of Joseph's service and Azaneth their service was? Is in the land of Egypt. You say, preacher, I can't live for God in this world. Joseph lived for God in Egypt. Joseph trusted God in Egypt. Joseph made a difference in Egypt. And you can make a difference in Egypt. You can make a difference where you live. You can make a difference right here. You can make a difference in your school. You can make a difference where you work. You can make a difference for the Lord. What was Egypt like? It was a place of temptation. We're living in a world of temptation. But I'm glad God said there is no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will also with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Uh, he's telling us there we don't have to give in to temptation. We don't have to be overcome by temptation. We don't have to get in sin. We can live a holy separated godly life if we want to God will help us say preacher well I couldn't help it you can't help it God will help you help it even Moses did that in Egypt remember what the Bible said Moses when he was come to years refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season by faith the Bible said he forsook Egypt fearing not the wrath of the king so here is Moses he's living in that same Egypt we've been talking about years later when it's gotten worse and worse and worse he's living in Egypt here's what he said I would rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season he lived for God. He took a stand for God. And he brought the people of Israel out of Egypt. You and I can take a stand. You and I can take a stand for God. 
in our families, in our communities, where we work. Even in a place of temptation, it's a place of tribulation, a place of trouble. Say, preacher, you know, there's just a lot of trouble. I know there is, but we're headed for a land where there is no trouble. We're going to a place where God shall wipe away all the tears from our eyes. Brother Kelly used to say we're going to step off on the sweet banks of sunny deliverance one of these days. We're going to march into the new Jerusalem one of these days. We're going to be raptured out of here. We're going to leave this place because this place of trouble and this place of tribulation and this place of temptation is also a place where we're going to triumph because he always causeth us to triumph. That's what the Bible said in Romans chapter 8. Paul said we've been made more than conquerors through him that loved us. When sir, I'm trying to remember the fellow's name that was the British admiral, when they were fighting in the Nile River trying to keep trying to keep Napoleon's forces from being uh, reinforced there and supplies brought and there was a great naval battle that took place there and in that naval battle, Lord Admiral Nelson was his name in that naval battle. Lord Admiral Nelson was mortally wounded. He died before the battle was completely finished but he said, he said this before he died. He said, send a communique to any England and tell them that victory is not a large enough word that to describe what has taken place here. I think about Paul in Romans chapter 8. He And I, I like to think of him like this, writing down, we are conquerors. And then he said, nope, that's not big enough. We are more than conquerors. We've been made more than conquerors through him that loved us. I'm telling you tonight, you don't have to live in sin. You don't have to live in wickedness. You don't have to live under the thumb of the, thumb of the devil. The Holy Ghost can help you live a holy sacrifice separated life right here in this wicked world while we're on our way to glory. He'll help you. You say, oh, preacher, there's trouble. I know, but we know the God of all comfort. We know the Father of mercies. We know the God that will keep us. And we're leaving this world one day. The old song is still right. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. When I pastored up in the upper Upper Peninsula, Michigan, for a few years, almost into Canada. We had some folks that we would bring to church. We called them the Songs and Sunshine Group. There was a mental hospital there, and uh, some of the patients, they closed that hospital down, they turned it into a prison. And they took the patients from that mental hospital and they spread them around the, the area and the county, and they spread them around in little group homes. And in one of those little groups home, group homes up the road from us lived two sisters, Tressie and Audrey, and their friend Clarence. And we would pick them up and bring them to the church service. There were others that would come sometimes, but Tressie and Audrey and Clarence came almost every time. And they we had two row, we had two sections of pews with the middle aisle. And they would always sit on the front row right there, and they loved their pastor. They just loved me, and I loved them. They'd come to the altar, and I'd pray with them. And I don't know how many times this happened, but it happened a lot of times, and it always happened exactly the same way. I would be starting on the sermon. I might have been through the introduction. I might have been all the way to the first point, or I might have been just reading the Scripture, but somewhere in there, Audrey would shout out loud, Preacher! That's just the way she talked. Preacher! I got a song on my heart. Well, I'm not going to tell Audrey she can't sing. I'd say, okay, Audrey, come up here and sing. I'd just mark my place. She'd look at Tressie and she'd say, come sing with me, Tressie. And they'd look at Clarence and say, come sing with us, Clarence. And the three of them would come up on the platform. It always happened exactly like this. They'd get up on the platform. I'd look at them. They'd say, sing with us, Pastor. So I'd look at Audrey and I'd say, oh, now, now I knew what she's going to say because she said the same thing every time. I said, now, Audrey, uh, what do you want to sing? She'd say, I don't know. What do you want to sing? <laughs> she just told me she had a song on her heart. But I knew she didn't really have a song on her heart because she'd say the same thing every time. So then when she'd say, I don't know. What do you want to sing? I would say what I said every time. Let's sing It Will Be Worth It All When We See Jesus. And they'd say what they said every time. Yeah, that's a good one. Now, they didn't know the words. And, and I wasn't really sure of the words. But they would look at me, and I would look at them. And they would mouth the words as I did. And we'd sing, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. I don't know if I can sing it right now. 
but we'd sing, it will be worth it all. When we see Jesus, life's trials will seem so small. When we see Christ, one glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Now, I don't know if those are the right words, but that's the way we sang it. Now, look up here. There are a lot of things I preached that went right over Tressie's head and Audrey's head and Clarence's head. They didn't understand it, but they had one thing right. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. My old friend, I'm going to tell you this illustration, I'm going to be done. My old friend, Emerson Frisch, he's in heaven now. He owned a hotel, and, and he's a businessman. He holds several businesses, and he would let me stay in that hotel when I was preaching in the area. Called it the Canary Hotel. It was painted yellow. I don't know why. But Brother Fritch and, and several other businessmen and a couple of preachers there was a young preacher named David Barnhouse. He'd been in the Navy. So they were at a meeting in, in uh, um, Elizabeth City, North Carolina, and they went up to Norfolk, Virginia. I think it's Norfolk, where there was a military, a naval base. And Brother Barnhouse got, got a captain, a naval captain, to take them on a tour of that naval base. So Brother... Um, Brother Frisch said to me, he, he, he said, this is what I was. He said, I was in the Navy four years, and he said, I was a white hat. And he never did explain what that was. A fellow tried to explain it to me a while back. But I got the idea that Brother, Brother Frisch was saying that a white hat was not somebody up top of the ladder. He's somebody down at the bottom. And so he said, I was the only one other than Brother Barnhouse and the captain that was giving us the, the, the tour he said, I was the only one been in the Navy, and we're going all over that naval base. And he said, I began to notice something because there was an aircraft carrier anchored at that base. And he said, I began to notice some things going on around that aircraft carrier. And he said, I don't think anybody else noticed those other businessmen because they'd never been in the Navy. But he said, I, I noticed some things. And then all of a sudden, that captain announced to us that we were going to get to board that aircraft carrier. So he described it to me, and I, I've never seen this done. I'm just telling you from memory what he said to me. He said that bosun's mate said we went up. When that captain set his uh, foot on the deck, that bosun mate blew that whistle, and when he blew that whistle, they snapped to attention. They saluted. There was a band that started to play. And Brother Frisch said this. He said, all of a sudden, I realized I was being piped on board this aircraft carrier. He said, I was a white hat. I was never piped on board anything. But he said, I was being piped on board like I was somebody. And then he said, I realized it wasn't because of who I was. It's because of who I was with. Amen. And I'm going to tell you one of these days. I don't know if that, I know there'll be a trump. I don't know if there'll be a whistle, but there'll be a trump. Amen. There'll be a shout. Amen. There'll be the voice of the archangel. And you and I are going to be piped on board. The new Jerusalem. And it won't be because of who we are. We'll be like Azaneth. It'll be because of who we're associated with and who we're with. We're headed for a glad day. Say, preacher, the world is hard. The world is tough. There's difficulty. I know that it is. I know it is. I know there's heartache. I know there's pain. I know there's trouble. But we're headed for a land that is fairer than day. We're headed for a place. So while we're here in this Egypt, while we're here, let's serve God. Let's do something for the Lord. Let's let somebody know we're not ashamed to be associated with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's accomplish something for him. If you're not saved, let's get saved tonight. Let's get right with God. Get in. Just get in tonight. Get saved. Get born again. And if you are saved, live for God. We're going to leave this world one day. And when we get to heaven, we'll be glad for those things that we did for Christ while we were here. Let's live for God. I want you to bow your heads a moment, if you will. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Our brother's going to come and our sister's going to come to the piano. Jesus took Azaneth. She wasn't fit to be his wife, but he wanted her for a wife. 
She hadn't lived a life that made her worthy to be his wife, but he wanted her for his wife. He took her. And you and I weren't fit to be saved, but he saved us. And tonight he'd save you if you'd ask him. If you'd come take your place as a sinner before him, ask him to forgive you of your sins, he'd save you tonight. He saved Sophia Sunday morning. He'll save you tonight. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Nobody's looking.